Matthew chapter 15, we have um, a continuation of the strife that began earlier in the book of Matthew between Christ and the Pharisees. You, you see throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the, the problems that Jesus had with uh, religious leaders. Uh, there were a few good Pharisees like Nicodemus, John chapter 3, that uh, recognized something very special about Christ. Um, but you have, for the most part, the Pharisees and the Sadducees at odds with Christ. They were continually at odds with Him because of what He taught was contrary to what they taught and what they practiced. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. It says, Then some of the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. The tradition of the elders was a, a group of uh, teachings that came really after the Babylonian captivity that the Jewish rabbis came up with. In other words, they, there, there were uh, all kind of rules and regulations that they felt were needed for daily life of the people. And so they would use these traditions, these uh, regulations, these rules, in addition to God's Word. In other words, they added to it their, their little traditions and their things that were um, things that they put on the same par with, on the same level with God's Word. And so... Jesus, as someone who was following the will of Moses, God through Moses, he was following the law of Moses and he never broke it, he never violated it, he followed it perfectly. Yet when he did not live up to the standards of the Pharisees or the Sadducees in his, in his practice and his teaching, they would oftentimes get in conflict with one another. And here's you have one of these incident, incidences. If I could talk, I would be a good teacher. One of these situations in which the Pharisees are in conflict with Christ. And so they, they had these ceremonial washings that they would go through. A lot of these traditions were in oral form. They were passed down uh, just by word of mouth. It wasn't until uh, about 200 A.D. that they were put in, put in written form called the Mishnah the Mishnah, the Jewish traditions. And as a result of that, they would go through all of these little ceremonial washings. He's not talking about hygiene here in verse 2, or the Pharisees are not, when they observe the disciples in Christ not going through these washings. Of course, the law of Moses had certain ceremonial washings and cleansings. But these are what the Pharisees had passed down to them in addition to, to what Moses had required or God required through Moses. And so Jesus and his disciples did not go along with those traditions. Now, traditions can be good and can be bad according to the New Testament. In what way are traditions good? Those that go along with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, is where Paul talks about keeping the traditions that I have given you. We have traditions that have been handed down that are from God Himself. We observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. That's a tradition. We find the pattern in it, of that in, in God's Word. We, we sing congregationally. That is a tradition. It's a command, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3 and verse 16, but it's also a tradition that's handed down from the New Testament that we sing congregationally. There was no uh, instrument used in early Christianity because that was not part of the tradition. That was a man-made tradition that was added later on. And so here you have Christ in conflict with the Pharisees, or really the Pharisees. They're, they're coming down from Jerusalem Jerusalem. 
and they are observing, they're looking for something wrong. They've already determined they want to destroy him. They want to get him because of what he was doing. He says in verse 3, And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourself transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. That was one of the many crimes, 16 in all in the law of Moses, that were punishable by the death penalty. Christ here is upholding the death penalty under the law of Moses. That the uh, children that speak evil against their father and mother are to be put to death. Exodus 20 and verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16, uh, Exodus 21, 17, and other passages talk about the children are to honor, respect, obey the parents and the those who do not and are rebellious are to be put to death. Verse 5, But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever I have, uh, whatever I would have helped, would help, excuse me, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father and his mother, and by this uh, tradition, you make void the word of God. Now, notice this. They had a tradition in which they could reinterpret what the scripture said. The scripture said, you honor your father and mother. And that honor goes throughout your life. When you're a child, children, young children, are to obey their mother and father and honor them. But when they get older, they're to honor their mother and father by taking care of them in their older age. See to it that the, the, the parents are taken care of when they uh, get to a certain point. The Pharisees had a tradition that said the money that you would have used to take care of your parents is not necessarily does not necessarily have to go to them if you contribute it to the temple. In other words, they relieve people from the responsibility of taking care of their parents by diverting that money from their parents to the temple. It was a way for the religious leaders to make some money. We have that same problem today, don't we, with the religious leaders on TV wanting money, send me your money, give me your money. We need a love gift as they're in their $900 suits and their Rolexes. Give us money. Our ministry is hurting. It's going to go off the air. We need your money. And so they beg and plead and talk about money all the time. Well, that's been an ancient problem with ancient religion. We want your money. And so the money that was going to go to helping the aged parents, they say, you're relieved of that responsibility if you take this money and put it into the temple which actually would line their pockets. So, he says, verse 6, He is not to honor his father or his mother, and by this you make void, or some translations say, invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So this tradition which taught the money that was going to be used to take care of your parents goes to the temple, was a religious tradition that made void or invalidated the word of God. So he's turning the tables on them. And he's saying to them, you are actually transgressing the commandment of God by your tradition. They are not, uh, Jesus and his disciples were not transgression, transgressing the law of Moses. They were, if you notice verse 2, notice what the Pharisee said. You break the tradition of the elders. He didn't say you break the law of Moses. You break the tradition of the elders. In other words, it was what was passed down. This religious uh, activity that was passed down. You're not involved in it. Why aren't you involved in it? Why aren't your disciples going through these ceremonial washings? And Jesus says to them, in essence, he turns it around and says, You actually transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. You dishonor the father and mother by this process that we just talked about. Right, right. He wants them to come to grips with what they're involved in. And he wants them to, to, to understand that they, they are the ones actually transgressing the commandment of God rather than 
the Jewish tradition. Right, right. He he's he's asking them exactly. He he go he turn always turns the table on them, and 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 asks them a question, trying to get them to realize some things. And when he does it, the matter and matter they get, the angrier and angrier they get. Verse seven, he says, "You hypocrites! Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips." But their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments or the precepts of men. So he's quoting from Isaiah 29 and verse 13. He said, you are hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied about you. That your people, you give me lip service. You talk a good talk religiously. But your heart's from, far from me. You worship, but it's in vain. How many people do you see? You see the banners, you see the you see the signs. Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves out in front of a church building, and they'll talk about Christ and they'll talk about Jesus and they'll talk about the Bible. Which, when you really get down to examine what they teach and practice, they are teaching things contrary to the will of God with their traditions, and they're not really following Christ. But they will talk a good talk. They'll talk about, oh, how they, they, they love the Lord and how He is Lord of their life. And they have a band. They use instruments. They have a choir. And, and they'll even talk about how God is blessing their, their, uh, their music ministry. Well, there's no such thing as a music ministry in the New Testament. And, and, but they're very sincere and they're very devout in what they keep. And by keeping their... They're what they believe to be true, they invalidate the Word of God. How many people today who have been sprinkled or christened as a baby by their parents will never ever actually be baptized according to the New Testament because they think in their mind they've already been baptized. And they'll invalidate the command to be baptized because in their mind, they've already been baptized through this man-made tradition of taking a baby, an innocent baby, and sprinkling water on its head. That tradition invalidates the command to be baptized, which is immersion in water, for a believer for the forgiveness of sins. Yet, that tradition invalidates that. And there are millions and millions of people who, if you go up and ask them, have you been baptized? They say, oh, yes. And what they mean is when they were two or three months old, their parents took them to the priest or the pastor and he got a little water on his fingers and sprinkled it on his head, on their head. And in their minds, they've done it. And as a result of that, they invalidate the word of God, which says he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 and verse 16. And so the, the worship is vain. See, worship, look at verse 9, but in vain they do worship me. Vain means empty. It means the, the worship is empty. How many sincere people have worshipped this morning all over Roar City, all over, all over North Texas, and it's been vain? In other words, a waste of time. All the money, all the preparation, all the um, activity going into their religious performances, and it's vain. It's vain because it's not according to God's will. It's according to the traditions of men. And just as the Pharisees look upon Jesus and his disciples as being strange, why aren't you following these traditions? People look upon us, the, the church of Christ, as being strange because we don't go along with the religious traditions of today. Look at verse 10. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. So he's going back really to talk about how that they thought the, the, the Pharisees uh, believed and had this tradition that you could uh, touch all these things um, in the marketplace and be defiled and it would cause you to be unclean spiritually. And, and, and you could eat certain things that were uh, 
that would make you defiled. And, of course, according to the law of Moses, there were some forbidden foods. Not according to the law of Christ, but according to the law of Moses, there were some unclean foods that the Jewish people were to avoid. But he makes it very clear, verse 11, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man or the person, the individual. Because it's out of the mouth, the heart is made known. And that's found all throughout the Proverbs that a, that a person who speaks is, is basically revealing their heart. That's what defiles an individual, makes them unclean. Verse 12, Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? So Jesus offended them. They were upset at what Jesus said concerning uh, calling them hypocrites, he says in verse uh, 7. Uh, that they were not uh, worshiping properly. Their worship was vain. Uh, their heart is far from God, even though they give him lip service. And they, they break or invalidate the word of God, verse 6, because of their tradition. That upset the Pharisees. And Jesus said to them, here's his, here's his response to that. He couldn't apologize. You can't apologize for speaking the truth. Now, there is a proper way of speaking the truth. And that's something, as a preacher, I have to always be on guard against. But you can't apologize for speaking the truth. And Jesus did not. Look at verse 13. But he answered and said to them, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and the blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit or a ditch. So he says in verse 13, he, he liken, likens them to a plant that the Heavenly Father has not planted. Now remember, he's already talked about earlier in chapter 13, the planting of the seed, God's Word. God has seed, and then in chapter 13 he talks about the evil one. The devil, he has seed. Remember the parable of the tares? He has seed that he sows. And as a result of sowing that seed, there are uh, things that come not from God, but are religious institutions that are a plant that the Heavenly Father has not planted. And they grow up. They will grow up together with the wheat, but there's going to come a harvest day in which the wheat and the tares will be separated. And so he says here, the plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted or rooted up. It's going to happen someday. And that's something that he is uh, talking about in context about the Pharisees. They're a religious group that will come to an end. They're not planted by God. They're not based upon God's word. Verse 14, he says, let them alone. He says, they are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. You have these religi religious leaders of, of Jesus' day that are of the, the group known as the Pharisees. They set themselves up as leaders. We are the spiritual leaders of Israel. We are the ones that will lead you to the way and the, and the ways that please God. And... Christ said they're blind. Now, if you have a blind person, do you want another blind person to, to help that person or to guide that person? You don't want that. Because both will fall into the pit. They'll fall into the ditch. You want someone who can see. You want someone that can see clearly the path, the way that you're supposed to go. And, and Christ is saying they're not the ones to follow. In fact, later on, He's going to tell them to, to be wary or beware of uh, the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's going to warn them about that. So he's warning them about this uh, time of, of harvest in which they will be uprooted and that they are blind guides. They are not showing you the way of truth. And as I said before, if we follow Christ and if we be the church, if we will be the church of Christ, uh, 
We're not going to go along to get along. Jesus did not go along to get along. And as a result of that, he came into conflict with the religious bodies around him. Did he not love the Pharisees? Well, sure. Did he not want the Pharisees to forsake their wicked ways and follow him? Why, sure he did. But they had to realize that what they were doing was wrong, and he had to, what we would call, give a little tough love here. Tell them that they're hypocrites and that their worship is vain. Any question or comment about verses 1 through 14? <clears throat> Look at verse 15. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding? Do you not know and understand, or excuse me, do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the thing that proceeds out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile a man. What's he talking about? Verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things that defile the man, but to eat what uh, eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. That goes back to what he was saying earlier in verse 11. And they didn't fully understand it, so uh, Peter says, explain to us what you're talking about. And he says, what you eat will not defile you. It is something that, that goes through the digestive system. But the things that morally defile you, the things that cause you to be a, a person that's not the moral person you ought to be, are the things that come from the heart. They'll proceed out of the mouth from the heart. Because that tells what type of person you are. The words that come out of your mouth. He says here's where it all begins. Sin always begins in the heart. It always begins here. And it is proceeded either out through the mouth or through action. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and slander. Now you think about that. To murder someone, you've got to develop dislike. And that dislike grows to hatred. And that hatred grows into murderous thoughts. And then it goes into action. Sometimes that can, that can happen in just a few minutes or even less when people act on uh, an impulse. But it always begins here. It always begins in the heart. That's where murder begins. Adulteries, again, that goes along. Both sexual sin, adulteries and fornication begin in the heart. It begins with a thought. It begins with a flirt. It begins with glances. It begins with things that uh, are inappropriate. Then it turns into the sexual sin. Thefts. You, you look at something that you want. You covet it. You desire it. Then you go and, and you take it. A false witness. Again, that begins in the mind. You've got to formulate what you're going to say. And you, and you bear that false witness about something. You, you lie about something. Slanders. When you speak evil of someone. Again, that begins in the heart. You think about what you're going to say, and then you say it. Verse 20, these are the things which defile the man, and not to eat, or but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. In other words, what the Pharisees are going through, they, they, they've got it all backwards. They think that if you can wash up on the outside, that you can get the inside clean. And that's not how it works. You've got to be clean from the inside out. And in fact, in Matthew chapter 23, and we'll get to it eventually, he's going to say, you're like, and he's denouncing the, the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, you're, you're like a real pretty tomb. Whitewashed tomb. Just real pretty. You've seen these gravestones. They're beautiful. But what's on the inside? Dead men's bones and all corruption. You give the outer appearance of being religious and pious, but on the inside you're corrupt. And the way Christianity works is it changes you from the inside out. It changes you from the inside out. That's why the seed has to go in the heart. God's Word, Luke 8, 11. God's seed has to go into the heart, and it has to germinate in the, in the person's mind and heart, and then bear fruit. 
begins here and then works its way out there. And religious activity on the outside, especially if it's a contrary to the will of God, is not going to make a person clean on the inside. You, you see this all the time sometimes in movies. Uh, you see a person that's getting in trouble. They're, they, they may be a wicked and evil person, but when they see that their, their, their life might be on the line, they start reciting the Lord's Prayer. Or they start chanting the 23rd Psalm. And it's as if they want to give the, the expression of religion and hopefully they think that this saying these things will, will make them okay when they haven't changed on the inside. They haven't changed on the inside. Just their outer circumstances have changed and they're beginning to realize their own mortality. They start chanting things that they've heard from before. But God wants to change on the inside out from the heart. The change takes place and then it's expressed in the life. Any question or comment about that? Yes, temptation. That's very good. Temptation comes from, from within the heart. James talks about that in James chapter 1. We're carried away by our own lust and enticed. Let's look at James chapter 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Verse 15, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Brings forth death. So there's the beginning point. How did it all begin? Look at Adam and Eve. You have the serpent there tempting Eve and said to her, you shall not surely die. Just altered God's word just a little bit. Added a word, not. God said, you shall surely die. She just added one word, not, or he did, Satan. You shall not surely die. And as a result of that, she looked at the fruit. It was desirable to eat. It was uh, appealing to make one wise, to be as wise as God. And that thought process was, was going on in her, in her heart, in her mind. And then it took action. She got it. She took it, she ate it, she gave it to her husband. And that's how the devil's been working uh, ever since. I was watching a documentary just the other day on uh, the BTK killer uh, and the one who uh, bind, torture, and kill, the person who did all kind of wicked things for years and has just recently been caught. And he was being interviewed in jail and he kept blaming it on, he's got this monster inside of him and and he, keep, he keeps blaming it on, uh, uh, he said, oh, I might have demons, I don't know. And he keeps blaming it on something else. And one of the guys that they were talking to, that I think it was a psychologist, but he hit, hit it right on the head. He said, he's just making excuses for his own lust. He has a desire to, to, to engage in this perverted activity that leads to death. And he's just trying to shift the blame. I mean, the BTK killer even said, you know, I was dropped on, on my head when I was a child. I mean, just, and he was very articulate, seemed very smart. And he blamed everything else except saying, I'm a sinful, wicked, horrible individual. But it began, and he talked about how he, 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 he would begin in his heart, you know, the things that he would carry out, those crimes he would carry out. We've got to guard our heart. Verses 21 through 28, you have Jesus with a, um, in a situation where she is uh, with, he is with a, a Syrophoenician woman. It says in verse 21, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Zidon. Well, let me show you Tyre and Zidon up here on the map. Tyre and Zidon were coastal cities. Uh, 
Here's Zidon right up here. And there's Tyre right there. So he was in the Phoenician area. Syria and Phoenicia. The Syro-Phoenician woman, she is called. In Sidon and Tyre, that region there. Pretty much a Gentile area that uh, Jesus was in. And it says here in verse 22, A Canaanite woman from the region came and began to cry out. <clears throat> Mark's account calls her a Greek born in Syrophoenicia. So this was not a Jewish individual. That's important to understand what Jesus is going to say to her. She is, uh, she is not Jewish. A Canaanite woman, she is called, began to cry out and saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. So in verse 22, she's crying out to Christ. She calls him Lord and calls him son of David. And that's very interesting that she must have had a knowledge of, of some of the Old Testament uh, writings that refer to the Christ, the Messiah, as a descendant of David, son of David. And so she had a knowledge of that. And she said her daughter is cruelly a demon-possessed. So there were demons that were, in, were involved in uh, this, this woman's um, ailment. She was cruelly demon-possessed, verse 23. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away because she keeps a shouting at us, crying out, some translations might say. So here this, uh, this Canaanite woman is crying out, and she keeps on crying out to Christ. And Christ is ignoring her. There's a reason. There's a reason. Verse 24, And he answered and said to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she, be, uh, she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said to her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once, or that very hour, or immediately, some translations might say. Now, why would Jesus ignore her, then say in verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then on top of that, verse 26, says it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Why would he do that? Didn't he love everyone, regardless of their background? What was he trying to do? Testing her faith, I believe that's the case as well, but he was also wanting to see how she would react to this. Now, it's very interesting here that Christ's mission was primarily to the Jewish people. That's why he said in verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The gospel would go to everyone, eventually. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, talks about the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Jew first. The lost sheep of the house of Israel first. Then to the Greek. So the ones who would have first opportunity, so to speak, would be God's own special people. Uh, the Hebrew people, and as a result, Christ came to them. And that that could be. That could be a possibility. She had a very definite humble spirit. Uh, that could be a very uh, good possibility, and 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 she had this hum humility about her. That, uh, that you just see, and she bows before the Lord, and she implores the Lord to help her, uh, and help her daughter. Uh, verse 26, uh, Christ said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Some translations might say proper. You don't take the children's food 
that you prepared for your children, give it to the dogs. The children eat first. Now, the word dog here is the word for a pet. It's not the word in Greek for the uh, the dogs that run around in the ancient world that were kind of wild and a nuisance. This word for dog here refers to a pet, a household pet that is cared for by the owner. And as a result, uh, he, it's almost a tender, compassionate type of, uh, of uh, description. Now, you compare that with the way the Jews viewed everyone else. The Jews, the Hebrews, viewed everyone that was not of the Jewish people, dogs. They were just dogs. And there was a, they looked down their noses at all the Gentiles, and they referred to them as dogs, the, the bad word for dogs. But Jesus uses a tender, affectionate word for dogs here that the owner of the house would care about this dog, this puppy, this, this small uh, dog that would be a household pet. And he was saying this to see how she would react. I believe that he was testing her faith. And verse 27, she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Yes, all of these blessings are for the children, but some of those blessings will come over. And the little dogs will benefit from the blessings that you give to the children. And notice what what he says, verse 28. Then he said to her, O woman... Your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. Great is your faith, or your faith is great. Notice who he's talking to. He's talking to someone who is not Jewish. He's talking uh, to a Greek woman. Now, remember what he said in verse 14 very quickly, and we'll close. Remember what he said to uh, Peter in verse uh, chapter 14 and verse 31? When uh, he tried to walk on the water, but he began to sink because he was looking at everything around him. He says in verse 31, You of little faith, why did you doubt? This is the irony of what we see in the book of Matthew. His closest apostles, oftentimes he will rebuke them for their little faith, their weak faith. And here a Canaanite woman, a woman who was not even of Jewish lineage, He says, your faith is great. He already earlier in the book marveled at a centurion, a Roman centurion, marveled at his faith, said his faith was great. The reason why he says that about a Jewish or a non-Jewish individual, they had to come through various obstacles to come to faith in the God of Israel. You had all in the Gentile world, all of these deities, the belief in all these gods, all of these a God for this, a God for that, a God for the other, for them to bypass all of that and believe in the God of Israel and to trust the New, the Old Testament writings that talked about the coming of the Messiah meant that they had to have great faith. But then his own people, who should have recognized him by their own writings, reject him. Or they can't figure him out. It's just... It's strange. It's, it's kind of like this, and we'll close with this. You'll have someone who's raised in, in the Lord's church. I say raised. Uh, they, they, they enter into the church as a youth, and they've been taught all their life all these things, yet they're not a solid Christian. And they just can't figure out why we do the things we do. But then you have someone who's a new convert that's just converted just a year or two ago, and they see it. They come out of a denominational background and immediately they see the contrast between denominationalism and genuine Christianity. And just been in the church just a few years or even less than that. It's just amazing sometimes. But we'll continue our study uh, next week, Lord willing.